and welcome to Game Set. Today I want to talk about video upscalers. What are those? Well, basically they take the video signals from your old consoles, screw around with them a bit, and then output them via HDMI, usually in 1080p, and hopefully your modern display can understand them. Now, these devices can get a little bit pricey and they're definitely not for everyone. And I'm only gonna talk about the video upscalers that I've personally used over the years. Anyway, with that said, let's start out with one of the most cheaply and commonly available ones. First up, we have this generic HD video converter, which is a SCART to HDMI adapter. You can get this one or something just like it for under 40 US dollars on Amazon. Others can have component or composite input instead of SCART, but the way the video is upscaled in these devices is all the same. Basically, on one side, you input your composite, component, or in this case, RGB SCART cable. You can input HDMI as well for some reason. On the other side, the output is via HDMI. There are buttons to toggle between SCART or HDMI input, 720p or 1080p output, or PAL or NTSC refresh rates. There are also analog and digital audio outputs, which is about as interesting as this sad little device gets. As you can see, the image quality is far from spectacular, but hey, this may be plenty fine for you. If it is, well, it's not my place to judge anyone. It does what it claims. It upscales the video for you, but it does it in the cheapest and most lazy method possible. For one, it stretches everything and anything to widescreen. I can fix this during editing or manually force my TV into 4x3, but it's still kind of annoying. Also, there are some older TVs that will not let you force them into 4x3. Next, it treats 240p signals like 480i. 240p is the resolution that every console pre-Dreamcast used the most. As a result, you can often see combing in the motion of many games or just oddities here and there. It also makes the picture look pretty soft, especially when games are scrolling. Games that flicker things on and off in rapid succession like the shadows here will appear as horizontal lines because of this. The good news and probably the best feature of this device is that by handling 240p as 480i, that means it's absolutely seamless when a console switches resolutions. Many 32-bit games love to do this to no end, and you won't miss a single frame here. Next, the picture is usually a bit off-center one way or the other. It's really not a big deal, but hey, you're not watching this episode for me to ignore stuff like this. Lastly, it applies a mild sharpening feature on top of everything to help mitigate the poor upscaling, and this doesn't help things at all. There are no settings to adjust to help anything here. That's right, the upscaler here isn't very smart. Not only is the video quality not tremendously great, but there is a significant amount of latency or lag here. It's not designed for video games at all, and while you can play many games using it, for some it can be an absolute nightmare. I bought this back before things like the Framemeister were readily available in an attempt to make the games on the show look better than the S-Video and Composite I was forced to use for recording my games back then. This was the Wild West days of trying to get good video from old consoles on modern displays. Overall, this is not a very good device, and I can't recommend it unless your only goal is to get the video from your console onto your HD TV as cheaply as possible. While the upscaling may be good enough for some people, the lag really should make it a hard pass. Keep in mind that there are lots of upscaling cables like the pound cables and others like them that feature this exact same scaler shrunk down and built inside them, lag included. Some of them may fix the aspect ratio. What's funny is that my upscaler died on me after I recorded Valus 3 for this episode, so I had to rely on Corey from My Life in Gaming to get all the other footage. And I've barely used this thing. I'm glad he had the same one I did and it didn't die. Your mileage may vary. All of the other devices I'll talk about in this episode blow it away. Don't believe me? Well, keep watching. All right, now let's get into some of the more pricey options. And by pricey, I mean costing more than $100, sometimes much more. And one of the most popular upscalers is known as the Framemeister. In 2011, the Framemeister, also known as the XRGB Mini, was introduced from MyComSoft and retailed for about 500 US dollars at the time. This would come down to about 300-ish once production ramped up. MyComSoft, as you know, is famous the world over for their development of Afterburner 2 on the Genesis, as well as the production of the XE1AP controller. This made MyComSoft a household name everywhere, even your house. Go ask your mom right now, she'll tell you. 
The Framemeister follows in the line of MyComSoft's other video upscalers and is the most popular thing they've ever done, outside of Afterburner 2 on the Genesis, that is. This little box has inputs for HDMI, RGB, component if you have a D-sub adapter, which is sold separately, S-Video, and composite. All video is output via HDMI at up to 1080p. Switching between the different inputs is rather slow, so it helps if you have the remote, which I have misplaced somewhere. Wait, here it is! The Framemeister has an English menu that can be installed, which helps out a lot. The unit didn't initially ship this way. In here, there are a ton of options to help you set up your picture. It takes a while to figure out exactly what everything does. Once you set up everything correctly, you can get a fairly nice 4x integer scaled output for 240p games. This means that your games will have a black border around them, but you can also zoom them in more if integer scaling isn't important to you. The Framemeister supports firmware updates via a micro SD card. The latest firmwares allow you to save and load settings to the SD card. This will also recall the inputs you had selected when you saved the profile. Unfortunately, there are only around 16 or 20 profiles you can have saved at a time. Some excellent profiles for each console can be downloaded from Firebrand X's website. For some reason, if you eject the micro SD card, you need to power the Framemeister up, then back down, and then on again before it's happy. I don't know why, that's just the way it is. Back in the menu, if you go into the image mode, you'll find a bunch of different settings. Basically, you want to select picture for progressive sources, which results in some nice sharp pixels, and natural when your source is interlaced. In this mode, some nice adaptive deinterlacing is performed and provided some of the best deinterlacing for some time. You can also enable fake scan lines in the menu. Here, you can adjust the int smooth and int line, which seems to adjust the overall brightness of the picture itself, as well as the lines. The scan lines look okay. Supposedly, they look much better in 720p, but no thanks. As far as overall image quality goes, the Framemeister is pretty good, though you can get some noise in dark areas or areas of a certain color. The Framemeister also screws up games that run at less than 60 frames per second. Check out Streets of Rage 1 here, which sadly only runs at 30 frames per second because I guess they forgot to turn on the blast processing. Notice the detail in the darker areas as it scrolls. Each time the game doesn't update, the Framemeister does something weird in those areas. Again, this only happens in the darker areas, just like the video noise. These flaws aren't the result of the capture device encoding, as the capture here is uncompressed, but it looks just the same when it's captured any other way or simply just playing on your TV. Yuck. Because of these flaws, it's easy to tell when a YouTuber is using a Framemeister. Hell, GameSack has been using Framemeisters almost exclusively for maybe 6 or 7 years now, until somewhat recently anyway. There is also a bit of video lag, but it's not bad enough that you can't get used to it in many games. However, with some games like ActRaiser with its quick jumping, I do have difficulty playing it on the Framemeister and I find the need to play it on a CRT instead. Oh, and whenever a game switches resolution, even in the slightest, the Framemeister freaks out and takes several seconds to pull its head out of its ass before all is well again. Sadly, this can make many 32-bit games like Dead or Alive on the Saturn here nearly unplayable. You're missing the first few seconds of each match and you're getting pummeled while you wait. Still, we dealt with it for capturing gameplay to make the show. Overall, I love the Framemeister, but it's definitely showing its age. On June 18th of 2019, MyComSoft announced the end of production for the Framemeister. You can still get them brand new, but they're getting pretty expensive. Open Source Scan Converter, or OSSC, is an open source project, hence the name, but the most common unit is the one provided by Video Game Perfection. It was announced in 2014 and initially released in 2016. It starts out at about 110 euros, which is about 132 US dollars at the time I'm speaking these words into this microphone right here. This one. For inputs, it has RGB Euro SCART, Component, and VGA. There's also a couple of 3.5mm analog audio input jacks. Output is via HDMI, but the first OSSC units only had DVI output. This unit is much more simple in what it does, is that it just line quadruples the video and doesn't actively process it. This means you're not going to get as much or any lag. However, it also means that you stand the chance of your TV or monitor not enjoying the signal that the OSSC outputs. If you can get it working, the image quality is much, much sharper than the Framemeister. There's also none of that video noise or interframe weirdness that you get with the Framemeister. 
Unfortunately, to achieve such good image quality, you'll often need to tinker around in the submenus and sampling rates, which will be different for each console and sometimes even between different games on that console. This can take a while, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Once again, there are some fake scan lines that you can enable. There are 16 levels that you can select from, starting at 6% opacity all the way up to 100%. The image brightness is not adjusted to make up for the dark lines added to the screen, so the overall image will just unnaturally get darker and darker as you go up. I feel that anywhere in the 30% area looks best in my opinion. My capture devices never liked the OSSC, so I honestly wasn't able to use it much. What I did use it for, however, was line doubling the Dreamcast and GameCube 480p video and then sending the 960p signal to the FrameMeister via HDMI, which then added a border around it and then spat out a 1080p signal. I then recorded that and used the captures for GameSack. Yeah, that's this show! Anyway, I did it this way because the OSSC handles 480p video much better than the FrameMeister does on its own. So it actually gave me much better image quality to do it that way, though not as good as I could have gotten if I had a capture device capable of 960p at the time. And that's because this method added the typical FrameMeister video noise and that inner frame weirdness to the signal. There's also basic deinterlacing on board in the form of bob and weave, which basically just line quadruples each field separately, but you'll still get that same shimmering and flickering that interlaced video is famous for. The OSSC is way worse than the FrameMeister when it comes to its handling of resolution switches. It often never even bothers to resync at all, it's just quicker to turn the thing off and then back on again. I'm guessing maybe they only made it for NES and Super Nintendo games in mind. I'm just kidding of course, but this does not handle these things well at all. The OSSC also features a micro SD card slot to update the firmware. I've only ever had to do this once. It also allows some slots to save and load profiles, but you need to remember which number goes with which system. Overall, the OSSC is cool, I guess. I just always wish there was a 1080p output mode that my capture devices would like. Now, you may be wondering how I'm capturing images if I said my capture devices don't like the OSSC. Well, I have some new devices now, and I may do a short episode on capture devices in the near future. Alright, now before any of you start hammering away at your keyboard, yes, I do realize that the OSSC is more of a line multiplier than an upscaler, but you know what? I don't care. It still belongs in this video. Anyway, we've got two more products to cover. In late 2020, the GBSC AIO came to market. This basically takes a cheaply available upscaler, adds Rama's custom firmware, and some additional hardware added from Zero himself and Amore 2600 to make an all-in-one unit. In fact, that's what the AIO stands for, all-in-one. This sold for about 122 US dollars on Zero himself's website. That's right, when these were available, you were buying it from Zero himself himself. Rama's custom firmware really unlocks the potential of the GBS upscaler and creates lag that's less than one frame, which is great. There are inputs for RGB Euroscart, Component, and VGA. Output is via HDMI, but also VGA and Component in some cases. Now these three guys are quick to say that the final output, while good, isn't reference quality or anything, but it's honestly not horrible. It is perhaps a little soft, dark, and maybe even a touch green when compared to the other upscalers though. The entire thing is controlled via a web interface using Wi-Fi. There is a lot of stuff that you can tinker with here, and you can even adjust the gain to make it a little brighter. I was able to set it up to get a perfect 4x integer scaling vertically, but the aspect ratio is wrong when I do this as it's too wide and I can't quite shrink it enough. When recording gameplay for GameSack, this isn't a huge issue as I can just correct the aspect ratio during editing. Anyway, besides allowing you to mess with a ton of different features, you can even save and load custom presets. Just like the OSSC though, you'll need to remember which number is what profile. As usual, you get some fake scan lines provided. You can adjust them in 5 steps, from 50% all the way down to 10%. I feel that 40% looks pretty good here. The unit can also downscale video to 240p and output it through the component jacks. Be sure to watch My Life in Gaming's 1 plus hour long episode showcasing this feature. When I first started playing around with my GBSC AIO, I was experiencing some screen tears occasionally in my Genesis games as seen here in Bart Simpson vs. the Space Mutants. This was fixed with a clock mod install. 
Fortunately, this is now standard on the GBSC AIO and trust me, it is 100% worth it. Even after this though, I noticed I was getting some screen tearing with TurboGrafx-16 games while making this video. It was really weird. But I found if I just rebooted the GBSC AIO, then it fixed the issue. According to the little readout on the web menu, the clock rate was wrong and resetting the device fixed it. Another great feature is the motion adaptive deinterlacing. Basically, this means that it handles four ADI sources just as well as the Framemeister does. But you know what makes it even better? The fact that it doesn't crap the bed when the resolution switches from 240p to 480i or from 480i to 240p. Playing Dead or Alive on the Saturn here is aggravating at best on the Framemeister and it's nearly impossible to play on the OSSC. It's absolutely not a problem here and the deinterlacing is fantastic. Get ready. <laughs> Some of you may have been wondering, what's this little wire near the HDMI jack? Well, that's the audio input. If you're using Component or VGA, for example, you'll need to route the audio in here, which is similar to what you'd need to do with the OSSC. With SCART, just plug in the wire that came with the unit back in and you'll be good to go. There's also a built-in sync strike that you can enable just in case you're having issues with the sync that your source is generating. Overall, this is a great little product, but they may be tough to get. Only 275 or so were made and they're all sold out now. This project is fully open sourced, and I don't know when or if they'll make more in the future, but it's a great mid-priced product that, well, it mostly delivers. <laughs> Lastly, we have the RetroTINK 5X from Mike Chi. This product is virtually brand new as it was released in 2021, just like this very video. Mike Chi's retro tink line has always been really cool, but at the same time, I was wishing for something that could do more than just line double or maybe even outshine the OSSC when it comes to image quality. My friends, I think we have a winner here. This one currently retails for about $300. Compared to the previous three products that I talked about, the retro tink 5X looks perhaps a bit less high tech and more simple. In fact, to the regular person, it probably looks more accessible. For inputs, it features RGB Euroscart, Component, S-Video, and Composite, which plugs into the green jack all by itself. Output, of course, is via HDMI. It comes with a generic ass remote with a bunch of stupid buttons, which mean absolutely nothing when you look at them. But soon you'll learn what each button does, and I'm sure some kind individual will make a nice overlay in the future, at least hopefully. I'm kidding, of course. I'm glad the remote is included. Anyway, the output quality of the RetroTINK 5X is excellent. It really is. Once you get everything set up, you can choose an output resolution. There's 480p, just in case you need such an option. 720p is here as well. Is that just not good enough for you? Well then how about 768p? Oh my lord! Then there's 1080p fill, which scales the image to fill the 1080p screen vertically. After that, we have 1080p over, which is a perfect 5 times integer scale, but it cuts off the top and bottom areas of your game screen slightly. Then, there's 1080p under, which is a perfect 4 times integer scale vertically. 1200p is a perfect 5 times integer scale, but now you get to see everything if you have a TV that goes beyond 1080p. Are you sick of me using the word integer over and over again in this video? Well, too bad, because I'm not done. Lastly, there's a 1440p mode, which is actually a perfect 6 times integer scale. Wait, what? Yeah, I thought this was the RetroTINK 5X, not 6X! Just what the hell is going on here? This false advertising! That's Mike Chi for you, always over-delivering. The 1440p mode won't work on every TV though, even if it's a 4K TV, and that's why he settled on calling it the 5X and not the 6X. Still though, if you can get it to work, it looks really nice. There are various sample modes that you can cycle through, such as generic 4x3 or generic 16x9. Then there are specific modes for most consoles at their popular resolutions. These use perfect horizontal sample rates and are a bit sharper than the generic modes. But I've got to be honest, the difference isn't huge. For that reason, I'd recommend the generic 4x3 mode unless you know exactly what resolution the particular game you're playing is running in. Generic 4x3 works perfectly fine. You're also more likely to get a correct aspect ratio using the generic 4x3 mode, which is not often the case when you're using the specific sample modes. Not only that, but some games like Kirby's Dream Land 3 use multiple resolutions at once. It's 512 pixels wide for these semi-transparent foreground objects while the rest of the game is 256 pixels wide. This all looks perfectly good in generic 4x3. 
If you put it into the 256H sample mode meant for the SNES, notice that the foreground objects lose their transparency and sometimes completely disappear altogether. It doesn't look right at all. Seriously, generic 4x3 is awesome. However, if you're playing a Neo Geo AES or MVS, you may find that you have some weird bendy lines or tears near the top of the screen. In that case, you're going to want to make sure your RetroTink 5X has been updated to 1.05 or later and then engage the Neo Geo 320 sample mode. That'll fix the issue that's specific to this hardware. I usually use the 1080p under mode for recording due to the 4 times integer scaling. There's also motion adaptive deinterlacing just like the Framemeister and GBSC AIO, but you can also choose different forms of deinterlacing if for some reason you need to. I don't think I need to go through each and every feature, but another one that you should be aware of is the LPF or low pass filter. If you have a poorly made SCART cable, you might see some interference in the video and be very upset. I mean, come on, this would upset anyone. But if you engage the LPF, most of these problems will usually just go straight away. Nice. Once again, you might lose a touch of sharpness, but really it's negligible and totally worth it. The fixed scan lines here are pretty good with a few different options. The polyphase lines at 50% are my favorite and look the most natural, though I feel that the image is still a touch too dark overall. The good news is that the polyphase scan lines look good in all resolution modes. One of my favorite features is the triple buffer mode. Basically, this means that it doesn't lose sync for seconds when a game switches resolutions and just makes everything much less frustrating. This means playing Dead or Alive on the 32-bit Sega Saturn is seamless and smooth. You can even scan a videotape forward or backwards and the picture still stays on screen. Try this with any other upscaler and they'll quickly give up. This mode adds a hair of lag, but the lag isn't constant. It's only there because it must repeat a frame here and there if your game console doesn't run at exactly 60 Hz. So you only have lag on those one or two frames every dozen seconds or so. The lag there would be up to one and a quarter frame, but normally the game runs at a quarter frame of lag, which is plenty good enough for me. Check this out, I can even play ActRaiser on it. Look at me go, wow. The opposite setting of the triple buffer mode is the frame lock mode, which means it runs at your console's refresh rate. And for retro stuff, that's rarely to spec. This is best for just playing a game instead of capturing it. If your TV can handle it, that is. You may or may not lose picture if a game switches resolution on you. It really depends on your TV. I haven't gone over every single feature of this product in this video, but I think I've covered the most important ones. Overall, the RetroTINK 5X is an outstanding device that is definitely worth the price in my opinion. I do wish some of the aspect ratios could be more correct, especially the Neo Geo one since I'm forced to use the Neo Geo H sample mode to play my Neo Geo games, but I am fairly confident this will be addressed in the future. You've got the crispness and the boldness of the OSSC, the motion adaptive deinterlacing of the Framemeister, and the quick resolution switching of the GBSC AIO. It's what I've wanted for a long time. My life is far less stressful as I make games hack. Marry me with my money. There you go, those are the upscalers that I've used and my experience with them. If you want to know what I think about the regular Retro Tinks as well as the M Classic, be sure to check out episode 260, which is called Modern Accessories for Retro Consoles Volume 4. And check out Modern Accessories for Retro Consoles Volume 3 if you want to know what I think about the Carby and the Eon plug and play devices. Anyway, what do you think about the devices that I covered in this episode? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Turf Masters on the Neo Geo. I love the Neo Geo. Come on, let's play. All right. What do you play at? Thomas Stewart. Good luck. Good shot. Nice. Congratulations. Oh, no. Oh. Nice ball. Ah.
not bad, but you know, I'd like to see you do better. On to the next hole. Ah, oh, no, no! Oh no! Oh, come on! I didn't want to play Neo Geo anyway. Please.